you to open a Bible to Acts chapter 18 as we continue our summer series going through the second half of the book of Acts, looking at how Jesus and the Holy Spirit moved through the early church to bring about massive transformation in people's lives and how we can follow in their example to have the gospel change our lives and the lives of people around us. And so as we open to Acts chapter 18, we prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's word. We begin with prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds to be made still by the Holy Spirit and to be receptive and open to the hearing of God's word this morning. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that they would be comforted and uplifted by the hearing of God's word and the gospel this morning. Finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would faithfully and truthfully proclaim the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So Acts chapter 18 continues the story of the apostle Paul. Paul is this great hero of the faith. He's this wonderful example that everybody looks up to, and then nobody ever thinks they can be like him. I've never met a single Christian that came up to me and told me, you know, I think I'm going to be like the Apostle Paul today. Right? Most people, we have some sense of humility that if you're familiar with the stories of Paul and you see all the amazing things that he did, don't put up our hands and say, I'm going to be like that guy. And this morning, I'm going to try to convince you to be like that guy, okay, <laughs> whether you want to be or not. Because there's a lot of lessons in terms of how to follow Jesus, how to share the gospel that we can learn from the Apostle Paul's life, and especially here in Acts chapter 18 when he goes to the city of Corinth. And the other reason I would argue for this is he commands us in his letters to imitate me as I imitate Christ, right? Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So even Paul was telling people in the churches that he was writing to, you can do it. <laughs> You could be like me because all I'm doing is following Jesus and pointing people to him. And you, as a Christian, can also do the same. So in Acts chapter 18, verse 1, we're told he, he leaves Athens and then he goes to Corinth. And so he's continuing this journey of going from metropolitan city to metropolitan city to tell people who have never heard about the gospel of Jesus about the gospel of Jesus. Now, here's the first lesson for us to learn from the Apostle Paul this morning. It's hard. All right? That, I know that's not a profound point. You probably didn't be like, yeah, I feel so much better that I came to church this morning. But it's hard. Right? Sometimes we have this disconnect where we hear about Paul. We're like, well, of course he did all these things and, and everything went smoothly. He's... Apostle Paul, he's a great preacher, he wrote the Bible, he does miracles, and all. That. And what you're going to see in Acts 18 is that, no, actually, life for Paul, following Jesus, sharing the gospel, is sometimes hard. It doesn't always go smoothly. It doesn't always go well. But on the flip side of that, we're also going to learn, in the midst of that hardship, how to have courage and encouragement just like Paul did. So he leaves Athens and he goes to Corinth. We're going to talk about that city in a moment. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy, and his wife Priscilla. So these will become partners in ministry with Paul. And so he meets them, he finds them by the grace of God, and they begin living and working together and sharing the gospel together. And so in verse 4... Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And then they opposed and reviled him. Right? It's hard. It doesn't always go smoothly for you in this world, especially when you want to follow Jesus, right? I'm always amazed 
and I do it to myself, so I amaze myself as well, not in a good way, right? When people, you and me, are shocked, offended, appalled when the world doesn't like what we have to say about God's word and Jesus. We're like, oh, this is so ridiculous. Why don't you like it? Why don't you? And, and then we get reviled or we get made fun of or we have awkward relationships and things change and it's totally different. And we're always almost stunned and amazed that it happens. But two really important people in the Bible tell us not to be that way. One is named Jesus, and the other is Paul. In the Gospels, Jesus tells his disciples, just so you know, they didn't like me, (laughs) and they're not gonna like you all the time. So he tells them, don't be amazed. You know what we do? We go out in the world, we're like, I'm totally shocked and caught off guard, Jesus. Right? He's like, I warned you that it would go like this sometimes. And then the apostle Paul, when he writes to Timothy, tells him, all people who desire to live a godly life, meaning everybody that wants to follow Jesus, live according to God's word, he says, will be persecuted and mistreated by the world. All people. Right, so both Jesus and Paul are telling us, don't be shocked. Some people are gonna hear the gospel and they're gonna be transformed. Other times, we're gonna share the gospel, we're gonna share the truths of God's word and people will not like it and they will not like that you're doing it. And this even happens to the amazing apostle Paul, right? He's preaching the word every Sabbath. Every week he gets together in the synagogue with people and in verse four it says he's trying to what? He's trying to persuade the Jews, the people there, that Jesus really is the Messiah, that Jesus really is the Savior. And his reward for this is that he is opposed and reviled. Right? And that, I think, is why we struggle with the reality of it being hard sometimes. Because we like to think, if I do what God tells me to do, if I follow him, then what? Should all just work out, right? It should just go the way I want it to. Everything should be smooth sailing. And yet what we see time and time again in the Bible, and through the life of Paul here, is that sometimes it's hard. Paul's doing exactly what God told him to do. And he's doing it faithfully and courageously. He's, I love verse five, says, he's occupied with the word. Like he's just like, what else you got, Paul? He's like, nothing, this is all I got. He just keeps telling people about Jesus, keeps telling them about the word of God. And then the response of people is, we don't like you and we're gonna revile you. Anybody ever been reviled before? Maybe you're unaware that you have been. I don't, like, that seems really strong, right? It's like, oh, they don't like me. No, like, we revile you. You're like, oh, that's, that's worse, right? But this is what happens to Paul in verse six. And then at the end of verse six, he says, so from now on, I'm gonna go to the Gentiles. So he's like, okay, I'm gonna go find more people to tell about Jesus. So this is lesson number two for us. Don't give up. So lesson one is, It's hard sometimes. Lesson number two is don't give up. So Paul's like, oh, you don't wanna hear about it? I'm gonna go find other people. Now this is Paul, right, the great missionary. On his first missionary trip alone, which is the one we're in the middle of, uh, commentators and scholars have done the research, they did the math, what they found out is that Paul traveled 2,000 miles by foot alone and 1,000 miles by boat on the seas just in his first missionary trip, not the other ones, just that first one that we're in the middle of, which is far enough to get you from Baltimore to Denver. So how many of you like have a Fitbit or an Apple Watch and you keep track of your steps? You're like, yeah, (laughs) only like 50 million more to go. Okay, great, right? This is is Paul, 
He's like, I will go anywhere, literally. I will walk 2,000 miles. I will go over land and sea to get people to know about Jesus. And then he finds hardship, which is not unusual for him. And he says, you know what? I'm going to keep walking to find people to tell about Jesus. And he goes next door. That's my favorite. He's like, I'm willing to walk 2,000 miles, but I'm also willing to walk next door. Right, so verse 7, he left there, meaning the synagogue, and went to the house of a man named Titius Justice, a worshiper of God. So he is a Gentile who knows the Old Testament, knows about God, and believes in God. And his house was next door to the synagogue. <laughs> That's great. Like, he's like, I can't go in here anymore. So he walks next door, knocks on the door. He's like, you got a big house. Could we meet here to talk about Jesus? Right? And so Paul shows us this tenacity of following Jesus, of not giving up. Because when it is hard, when it is difficult, it doesn't go well, or it feels like your, your prayers are not being answered the way you want, people are not changing, or what, they're not accepting your invitation, whatever it might be, guess what Satan wants us to do? That's ah, too hard, I'm gonna give up. And Paul's example is, yeah, I'm not gonna give up. I'm just gonna go find more people to tell about Jesus. Now you are sitting there going, but I'm not Paul. I am not walking 2,000 miles. I really doubt any of us are gonna try that. That's a, that's a lot of miles to walk. But Paul walked next door. That's not very far. Your smartwatch is gonna not tell you that you did vigorous exercise because you walked next door. So maybe you're like, I can't go 2,000 miles. I'm not a world-traveling missionary. Here's my encouragement, my question for you. Could you go next door? Could you go to the office building near yours? Could you go to the cubicle? Could you go to the person that lives near you or next to you that you go to school with, whatever it may be, and say, okay, well, now here's a person that I can talk to about Jesus. I can share the love of God with. And I love Paul's tenacity. He's like, okay, it didn't work out this time. So I'm gonna go next door because there's another human being there. <laughs> he just knocks on the door. He's like, do you know the Lord? Can I talk to you about Jesus? And he does this, and this is how the church in Corinth begins. In verse eight, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed the Lord together with his entire household. And then many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. Now, verse eight is like where you want to end this story, right? Anybody like happy endings, right? Anybody watch a movie and it doesn't tie all the loose ends up and you're like, oh, this is so frustrating, right? Verse eight is where you want the story of Corinthians to end. It's just like, look, even the leader of the synagogue who rejected us believes and got baptized. All these Corinthians who are Gentiles believe and baptized. What a great trip, Paul. Let's go back home. Now, here's what I want you to know. It doesn't end there, okay? And the Corinthian church becomes one of the most difficult churches in all of Paul's ministry for all of his pastoring and all of his work. And so what I wanna do now is talk to you about why we can keep going even when it seems hard. Because it's one thing to be like, oh, okay, it's hard, right? It's another thing to be like, hey, look, follow Paul's example. He didn't give up, so you don't give up. All right, and that's a nice little rah-rah speech and it'll work for a couple days, maybe a week. But what I know about my own heart is that I need a little bit more than just like, you can do it, right? You know how many times I've joined gyms and not gotten in shape? All of them. Every single one I've ever joined. It's like, oh wow, okay, that sounds like a good deal. Oh, okay, never mind. All right. So it, it can work for a little bit. So what I want to do here at the end is talk to you about the Corinthian church so that you and I have something that sustains us in ministry and sharing the gospel in our lives more than just, well, Paul did it, and I can go next door, and I can share the gospel too. So verse 9, most scholars assume some time has passed, right? Because verse 8 wraps it up so nicely. Everybody got baptized, right? You're like, well, that's great. Well, we know verse nine, something happened in the middle between verse eight and verse nine where Paul needed some encouragement. So God shows up in verse nine. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, 
do not be afraid, right? So how many of you are afraid of verse eight? You're like, no, that's actually, that would be really cool, right? So something happened. What we do know from the letters that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, we're gonna look at in a minute, Life happened, sinners happened, humanity happened, things got tough and difficult, and even Paul was like, yeah, I'd like to go to a different city now. <laughs> I'd like to move on, right? So verse nine, God shows up and tells him something he needs to hear. Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. I think Paul is a human being, right? like the rest of us, who has struggles and fears. And when things get hard, when there aren't you know, the miracles of verse 8 always happening, which we know from his letters were not consistently happening, even Paul is like, yeah, I'm ready to quit. And when we get to that thing, Satan works on our hearts and he works on our minds and he battles against us and guess what we wanna do? Life is easier if I don't bring up Jesus. Your conversations with people that are non-Christians out in the world and in your workplace and in your neighborhoods, right next door, wherever it might be, are probably gonna be easier if you don't bring up Jesus. And here's my proof. Um, I remember when I was on Vicarage, uh, when you're on Vicarage, you have to do whatever your supervisor says so you can pass, okay? So <laughs> my supervisor was like, I got an assignment for you, all right? He's like, I want you to go to a coffee shop. I don't drink coffee. <laughs> so I was like, well, okay, do you know any good ones? Because <laughs> I don't drink coffee, all right? And I want you to begin interviewing people about faith. Now, I don't drink coffee, and I have a social anxiety disorder. So the last thing I would ever dream up on my own, in my crazy little mind is, I'm gonna go to a coffee shop and talk to strangers out loud about Jesus. And then he was like, I want you to film it. Okay. Like, are you just like torturing me here, man? Like, what's going on? Right. So anyway, I did it, I passed Vicarage, and I'm here now, okay? so. Now here's what I noticed for the majority of people. Now I was in the Bible Belt, so it's a little bit different. Right? Um, people were, were a little more open in conversations and stuff. But here's what I noticed. Most of the conversations were cordial and friendly and nice. As long as it was just about faith, God in general, or spirituality. As soon as I brought up the name Jesus, things always got awkward except for with the people that already believed in Jesus. Right? It, it went immediately from like, oh, this is kind of a nice, exploratory, friendly conversation to you brought up Jesus, and he's the only way to salvation, and he's the Messiah, right? All the things that Paul has been doing in these verses, right? He's been occupied with the word. He's trying to persuade people of what? That Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior. And so that's what I learned from that experience was like, huh, you can talk about faith in general. You can talk about spirituality. You can talk about God as long as it's a generic, deistic God. But as soon as you bring up Jesus, I watched people's body language shift. People were like, oh, well, now we're getting serious. And this is the temptation. This is how the devil works against us in ministry. It's like, it's easier for Paul's life, not just yours. Look at Paul's life. He would not be reviled <laughs> and opposed if he did what? Stayed silent. Just stop talking about Jesus, Paul, and we'll be okay with you. So something happens, and Paul goes through what all humans go through, which is Satan opposing us through all kinds of means to convince us, why don't you stay silent? Why don't you just live in fear? And yet God comes to Paul and says, here's a message your heart needs to hear, Paul. Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. And then God tells him, here's why. For I am with you. You know the Great Commission? Matthew 28 is the most famous version of it. Acts 1, Mark 16, they've all got them. Luke 24, right, it's not just Matthew. I'm bringing them all up so you go home and read them. 
Jesus tells his disciples what? I want you to go into the world and do what? Don't be afraid, don't be silent, but go on talking, keep speaking, keep teaching people about what? Jesus in specific, right? And at the very end of that, Jesus tells them what? I'm with you always, the very end of the age. Even Paul needed that reminder. God comes to him and says, I just wanna remind you. Some good things are happening. (laughs) There's also some hardship for you. And through it all, God says, you can keep going because what? I am with you. And he says, no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. Now, I wanna talk about why that was a miraculous statement for the Apostle Paul. Corinth was not what you would call a godly city. Right? No one in the world at the time would have looked at Corinth and said, that's a moralistic beacon of ethics and goodness. Okay. The Greco-Roman culture even invented a, a slur, a, a demeaning term called a Corinthianizer, named after these people. <laughs> All right. And what it meant was a Corinthianizer was basically someone that had zero morals and zero ethics and lived a completely and utterly selfish life. And Paul's sitting there <laughs> trying to persuade all of these people to believe in Jesus. And God goes, don't worry, Paul. I got a lot of people in this city. Now you're like, well, it's God. I'm, I'm, you know, he's probably telling me the truth. But if you're a human being <laughs> and you're Paul, you're sitting there going, how many is many? Right? Like, let's, what, are, what are the numbers here? I'm a numbers person, God. <laughs> right? Because he knows what? Oh, these are Corinthianizers. These are people that are the, the other pagans in the Greco Roman Empire look at the Corinthianizers and go, Y'all are really bad. That's when you know you're really bad when all the other people with all of their Greco-Roman pagan gods and all of their sexuality and all their stuff, look at you and go, well, geez, we're not that messed up. And Paul's like, are you sure, Lord, that there's people here for you? Now, here's the amazing thing. God was telling Paul the truth. Now, you're like, oh, of course God's telling the truth. No, it's amazing, though, when you need to be reminded of it when you're struggling, when you're going through hardships, when you wanna quit and not keep going 2,000 miles or not go next door, when you wanna be silent because you're filled with fear, to remember, oh, God's telling me the truth in his word. And the result of the story is that Paul continues his ministry in Corinth for 18 months. It's the second longest place he ever stays. And a church forms, and people learn about Jesus and get baptized and have their whole lives changed. See, this is why it's so uplifting and encouraging to us because sometimes you look at the world, maybe you look at your family or your circle of friends, and you're like, when are things gonna change? It'll just be easier to be silent, just go along with things, not bring anything up. And you're just like, well, it's hopeless. I've prayed about it. I've done all these things. We want to quit. And we forget the promises of God where he says, no, no, no. I have many people in this city, Paul. Why is that such an important reminder for you and me? Because that was the word. That was the promise from God that made it so Paul didn't quit. That Paul didn't give up. You're like, well, okay, this is Kansas City, not Corinth. True. But here's what I want you to see. If you're Paul, if you're the apostles and say they had a a voters meeting on where we're gonna go next as missionaries, I would argue that the last city that they would pick is Corinth. (laughs) Like, yeah, we're gonna go there and we're gonna redeem the Corinthianizers. Eh. Right? Well, you're like, oh, that's, 
that seems a little, a little foolish, a little dreamy, right? That seems impossible, Paul. So no, we're not gonna go there. We're gonna go to the places where people are a little more friendly, where there's a little more synagogues and all these things. We're not gonna go to the Corinthianizers. Right, that's the other temptation, that when things are hard or it's not working, it feels empty or difficult. It seems like, oh, it would just be silent because they're not gonna believe anyway. They're not gonna change. And the power of this story is to remind you, me and to every Christian, is like, if God looks at the Corinthianizers <laughs> and he looks at the city of Corinth and he goes, I've got a lot of people here. They don't know me yet, but they're going to. What that reminds us is there is nobody beyond the redemption of Christ. Right? Satan wants us to believe that we should just give up, we should just be silent, we should just throw in the towel and say, yeah, I'm done with those people or that person, or I've given up the prayers on, for these people or whatever. And yet, Paul needed to hear a message, you and I needed a message where God looks at the Corinthianizers, the last people on planet Earth that anybody at the time of Paul would have thought, they're gonna turn to Jesus. And he goes, don't worry, Paul. We got a lot of people here. Not even the Corinthianizers are beyond my saving grace. Now, a few things about Corinth that makes this so miraculous. And I wanna conclude with, how did Paul bring about all of this change in Corinth? Right. So, you probably heard 1 Corinthians 13, right? The whole chapter of love. It says, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have a prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I have to deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. How many of you have heard that passage before? How many of you just, you hear 1 Corinthians 13, you just feel warm and fuzzy in your heart, you're like, Oh, these are nice verses. <laughs> um, these are insult verses from Paul to the Corinthian church, but we read them at weddings because whatever. All right? <laughs> now, here's the deal. The church at Corinth was in the middle of all the Corinthianizers. They had been Corinthianizers themselves. And Paul writes to them about love and the importance of love and how God's love is beyond anything you could ever obtain in this world. And he does all this fancy, beautiful language of if I speak in this, if I do these things, if I have power, if I have influence, if I have money, and all these things, but I don't have love, I count for nothing. There's a reason he picked these. So one of the things about Corinth is they hosted something called the Isthmus Games, and which is basically the equivalent of the Olympic Games for TED Talks and speaking. And so people from all over the world would show up and have speech contests and philosophy competitions there. And so he's like, if I speak eloquently, which if you were gonna be in those games, guess what you should do? Speak eloquently. But I don't have love, I'm nothing. Or he talks about if I have prophetic powers. Um, the temple of Aphrodite sat on a thousand foot hill in Corinth. And it was one of the most prestigious and largest temples in the ancient world. And it was filled with uh, temple prostitutes, which was pretty common in the Greco-Roman uh, uh, world and religions. And every night, um, a couple thousand or so temple prostitutes would come down into the city of Corinth looking for what they called worshipers to receive prophetic power. And he's saying, oh, you can have all the power, you can have this temple, but if you don't have God's love, you don't have anything. Right? And Corinth was also one of, if not the wealthiest city in the Roman Empire because it sat in this perfect place where it had two harbors, two ports, both on the west and the east, and it had land bridges that were very easy to get across. So any trade that was going east or west, north or south in the Roman Empire went through the city of Corinth, which means, guess what they had a lot of? Money to give away, to spend on to do whatever, and Paul says, I could have all the money in the world, give it all away, but if I don't have God's love, 
So Paul's reminding these people, these Corinthianizers of, hey, you had this way of living, but there is a better way, a a way that's not found in power or prestige and awards. It's not found in wealth. It is found in the love of God. And so when he writes 1 Corinthians 13, he's reminding them of, this is the way of your culture. This is the way that many of you lived, but I wanna remind you of the better way of living, which is through Jesus Christ. Now here's how he convinced them to choose the way of love, the way of Jesus, rather than the way of the Corinthianizers. It's gonna blow your minds. He told them about Jesus. And that's all he kept doing. Now, here's why this should blow your minds. We, as modern human beings, especially as modern Christians, struggle with the reality that Jesus is actually enough to change people, even Corinthianizers. Now, I know you're sitting in the pews right now, and you're looking at me like, don't you tell me that, pastor. Point the finger at somebody else, right? But we do. We struggle to believe that in in the way we live, in the way we speak, because we think what? I've gotta do this or that, gotta have this program or that thing. By the way, there's an entire industry, and I know this because I'm a pastor, I get the emails all the time, called church conferences. Now they're not bad, you can go and get encouragement and new ideas and everything, but you know the whole point of them, right? By the way, they show up every three to six months. So the cycle. So I get a lot of emails, y'all. All right. And every one of them, the whole point is predominantly what? Do this and you'll get results. Do this thing now and you'll get these results. Do this thing now and you'll get these results. If you are looking at the city of Corinth, with all its power, all of its influence all of its wonderful culture and everything else. And you're like, we've got to figure out how to redeem and bring the gospel to these Corinthianizers. Our gut instinct in our modern culture would be, well, let's put a strategy together. Let's plan some things out, develop some programs that will be attractive to them. And then the whole selling point will be, It'll work, right? And here's what Paul did in Acts 18. It says he was occupied with the word. He was trying to persuade them with the word. And in his letter to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. How many of you have heard that verse before? You're familiar with that one, right? I decided to know nothing among you except for Christ, Jesus, and him crucified. We we share it a lot. It's quoted a lot. It's used a lot. It's wonderful. I need you to believe it. Paul's whole strategy to see people like the Corinthianizers. But most of the world would say, y'all are, y'all are beyond redemption. You're beyond saving. His whole strategy for seeing their lives change and a church come out of nothing was to tell people about Jesus and his cross and his resurrection. And then if you keep reading 1 Corinthians, guess what he kept doing? That. His whole strategy was, I'm gonna tell people about Jesus because Paul believed the message of the cross of Jesus will be enough to change life. So my encouragement to you is to listen to the promise of God in Acts chapter 18, verse 10, where he says, for I am with you, so do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent is that as you go into the world, that you would remember, God is with you. But even when it feels hard or difficult, no, God is with me. That you would keep on speaking and not be silent. 
but that the things you would speak about would be Jesus and his cross and his resurrection. And that like Paul, you and I would trust that that will be enough, that's a powerful enough message to transform anybody's hearts. And then we remember, well, if God can redeem and love and forgive and save the Corinthianizers, then nobody else is beyond his grace or his love or his redemption. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you indeed are with us as your people. May we follow you with courage and faithfulness and obedience. May we keep going and not be silent. May we keep sharing the power of your cross and your love through your death and resurrection. May we trust that that message is powerful enough to redeem everyone and anyone, that your love is big enough for all people. In your name we pray, amen.